Shelley. Thank you for joining us. Yes, you're welcome. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Likewise. So I've been reading your uh, very uh, fascinating book, Tantric Psychophysics, A Structural Map of Altered States and the Dynamics of Consciousness. And this, this is a book which is um, really probes into the biology of altered states of consciousness and, and really even goes beyond uh, what we might think of as uh, altered states. So kind of energy and um, maybe mind as something that's actually outside of the human being as well. That is quite um, uh, quite radical in its uh, in its approach, but certainly it's very fascinating. How did you get interested in tantra and psychophysics and biology and altered states of consciousness? Well, I I um, I entered uh, my my first university uh, is to study nuclear physics, but I ended up going into electrical engineering because I was very interested in communication in how how to communicate. I, I thought radio waves were fascinating because they're invisible. Hmm. And, and back when I was in engineering school, there was no internet at all. So uh, communication was a very important thing. And um, just before my final year, it was a five-year program to study electrical engineering. I went to California to be a, um, a summer programmer, a student programmer at a missile base. And um, But I had just married... And um, my spouse was an artist, so we we sort of gravitated towards the art art community. Mm-hmm. But I got talked into taking LSD on the beach in California. Okay. Um, yeah, and it was uh, uh, quite an eye opener. I mean, it was like uh, nothing that I had ever imagined it would be like. Right. And um, but it but it, it the, what came out of it was the idea of consciousness. That this is a yeah. There's a whole new. Um, uh, no new field that science should really explore. I mean, I don't think many scientists were taking LSD at the time, even now. <laughs> no. <laughs> they, they're afraid of losing their their cognitive skills or something, I suppose. And but uh, but for me, I was a young uh, trained in science and engineering, and uh, this seemed like the most exciting thing to to study and explore. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it turned out to be it, it was. Something I've explored my my whole life. I actually eventually went into software development and software engineering for a career, but I continued to study anything I could about consciousness. Mm. The only thing I could really find about consciousness was not in science; it was in uh, religion and philosophy and mysticism. Right. And um, so, I I. Actually, for a year or two, I, in my, my, this was my early, mid-twenties, I continued to explore on my own um, uh, using different types of psychotropic drugs, uh, mescaline and peyote and uh, uh, mushrooms, psilocybin mushrooms. They were all slightly different, but they all had one quality in that they, they seemed to open up my awareness to a much wider range a wider bandwidth of, of uh, experience, mm-hmm. and um, it it was uh, it wasn't just the visual uh, uh, things and and the auditory things, because what I found I preferred doing was to do this alone at night um, in a dark room uh, in my home, very you know, uh, very isolated and quiet. Just going deeply into the the the, um, the exploration of consciousness, mm-hmm. and I really started. These were other senses that were opening up. Maybe there were uh, senses on the on the growth tip of evolution. You know, just like we've developed the senses of uh, of, of sight, and, you know, vision and taste and smell and touch, uh, but. But it felt like there were other senses. It was very hard to describe, but it was very real. Mm-hmm. So I, um, being very academic, I, I, I studied and got as many books as I could on Asian mysticism and Christian mysticism. Mm-hmm. And um, I eventually found there were some scientists, sci- scientifically trained people, who were yeah. also had a passion for exploring consciousness and trying to understand it. One of them was John Lilly. Uh, John Lilly was a 
uh, an MD. Uh, also, he was a ham radio operator, as I was, so he was interested uh-huh. in communication. And his first big project was trying to um, communicate with porpoises, human porpoise communication. And he actually got funded by the national, uh, uh, the, by the government, the federal government, to do this research. Uh, he called it interspecies communication. Uh-huh. But eventually, um, they found out he was giving LSD to the porpoises <laughs> and, and their trainers, and he. he um, he had them doing it in a in a dark uh, pool, a swimming pool enclosed in, in a building, and he would record uh, all of the electromagnetic fields that were going on at the time, and also the audio, the sounds the porpoises made, and just trying to figure out how uh, what was going on. And the the humans felt that they were very close to the porpoises, especially mm-hmm. with LSD. They felt that they were communicating in nonverbal yeah. ways. So unfortunately, the government found out he was using LSD about the time they were making it illegal, so they right. shut down his project. Oh, and he, he the government confiscated his porpoises uh, and shipped them to um, the same naval base where I was a summer programmer in California that summer. So I met him on the pier. Uh, they were training his porpoises to, to put magnetic bombs on the, the bottoms of ships in Haipong Hai Harbor. This is during the Vietnam War. Wow. <laughs> so he was quite upset about it. But uh, uh, anyway, I, I got to know him, and I, I also met him later when I moved to New York after I graduated. Mm-hmm. And he uh, shifted from his research with porpoises to trying to explore consciousness directly by himself. Mm-hmm. He He started building these... Um, he called them sensory deprivation chambers, mm-hmm. which were light proof and sound proof. And he would float, uh, in, uh, highly salted water, uh, slightly warm, just mm-hmm. slightly below human body temperature, uh, in order to attenuate uh, all of the, his normal external senses, you know, the external yeah. senses that we use to navigate space and time. Sure. And he believed that he was, um, I mean, he did this for a number of years, uh, probably the rest of his life. He actually helped me with the design of a, a, a meditation chamber in my 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 little loft on the Lower East Side in New York. So I started meditating in really quiet, uh, light-proof uh, chamber that I had constructed. But he used to take uh, ketamine, which is a it's a, it's a kind of a yeah. drug that uh, enhances your senses. Right. And he's written some really amazing books. I don't think they sold a lot, but he describes his experiences of communicating with other conscious entities uh, in the mm. planet and the universe and possibly in other dimensions. Um, I, I think he wrote one book called Simulations of God. But he also had this theory that the human brain, he called it the human biocomputer, the brain could be reprogrammed uh, to begin to operate uh, new senses uh, mm-hmm. beyond vision and, and, and sound. So this tied right into my own thinking, and um, uh, it's kind of uh, uh, guided what I've done ever since. Um, I, when I finished uh, pretty much my career as, as a software developer, I, I entered a Ph.D. program in consciousness studies, mm-hmm. uh, sort of the icing on the cake of my, my yeah. academic career. And I discovered the work of the physicist David Bohm and the right. brain scientist Carl Pribram. And uh, that gave me uh, a lot of new material to integrate with what I had studied over the years in um, Indian uh, yoga and Tantra, Tibetan Tantra. I actually right. had a Tibetan teacher for quite a while. Uh, along the way, I got a master's degree in Indian philosophy and studied Sanskrit so I could try to decipher some of the te- texts like the Tanjali Sutras, which yeah. is a classic text on contemplation. Yeah. So so after these many years of study and practice and experience, I've b- b- tried to uh, and began to integrate a lot of the material. Mm-hmm. Uh, it started to make sense in lots of ways. Um, I also studied, uh, I must say, Rudolf Steiner was, was very important. Uh, Steiner yeah. was a... Um, he actually he founded the Waldorf schools, which is now right. 
worldwide system of schools that help uh, um, train not only the intellect and the and the cognitive abilities, but the whole human emotions and and, yeah. and deeper sense of self. Right. So Steiner was actually trained as an engineer himself. He mm. went to the Vienna Institute of Technology, and not a lot of people realize that. But uh, he he used to. Uh, I I really believe he experienced uh, drugs also, entheogenic drugs. Mm which were not illegal back then. In fact, one of his colleagues, yeah. uh, somebody he knew, was Sigmund Freud. And, of course, Sigmund Freud used lots of cocaine. Um, oh, right? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, they, they used it, I guess, in the way I did early on, to, to get, you know, to see what's there and, yeah. and experience it firsthand. Right. The, um, and, and back about 100 years ago, this was a, a common thing in the United States, uh, it, it was uh, William James. He's known as the father of psychology in America. Yeah. He was very much interested in uh, uh, things like nitrous oxide and uh, and cocaine and mm -hmm. uh, various substances. Of course, they didn't have LSD, and they didn't uh, have any knowledge of psilocybin mushrooms or ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and now uh, these things are very uh, more available than they were back then. And I believe what we really need to do as a civilization is have scientists, uh, people trained in science, also become interested, like like I did and John Lilly and and, and a few others, mm -hmm. in trying to understand consciousness and trying to look at Indian mysticism and Tantra uh, with a more serious, open eye instead of just dismissing it. Because, yeah. frankly, I, I really believe that the Indians, the Tibetans, and the Chinese Taoists, they're kind of the scientists of the interior, right. whereas Western science is a science of exterior, a science yeah. of, uh, you know, things you can measure in, in, the, in the light of day, things that you can measure uh, repeatedly, mm -hmm. and you can, you can uh, record, uh, you can measure the weight and, and what happens. But uh, studying consciousness is quite different because it's it's a uh, science of the interior of the unknown mm -hmm. uh, consciousness, and of course psychology is a field that most people think well psychologists would be studying consciousness, but they really don't. They study yeah. behavior. That's they right. they 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 observe and they take they take data and they make theories to try to help people. Uh, fit in better to society and, and to life and, yeah. and and they're mainly dealing with pathology you know right. uh, most psychology is how to heal people who are mm -hmm. mentally ill or have mental challenges or yes. you know whereas um, the the uh, scientists in India I call them scientists uh, you know the yogis and the swamis and the saints even mm -hmm. the Christian saints they were really the scientists of the interior they were um, exploring, and they were um, they were observing, and they were coming up with theories. Hmm. So I've spent the last thirty years or so, at least, uh, maybe more, really studying a lot of the writings of uh, uh, Christian and Indian and Tibetan mystics, uh, mm -hmm. Chinese Taoists too, are also mystics, and trying to correlate what they all have in common. So if yeah. if I see things that uh, that they say are similar, it gives me a, a better feeling that they, they're on to something. You know, it's not just um, speculation that's going nowhere. And so yeah. I've, I've, I've integrated this with what I understand of quantum mechanics and physics mm -hmm. and tried to express it in my, my new book, Tantric Psychophysics. Yeah. Um, the, the actual, trying to give an idea, uh, a scientifically uh, un supported idea, of how people can develop and change their minds, reprogram, uh, add new programming to their own consciousness to activate new sensory systems. Right, and yeah. it's, 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 it's uh, first of all, people have to have the motivation to do it. That's often hard to do in our, our world of sound bites and entertainment yeah. and everything. So much is going on. Yeah. Uh, not a lot of people have the motivation and the discipline to, to actually begin to develop these things, right? But um, I'll, I'll try to give my 
the heart of my theory in 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 a three minute <laughs> three minutes here. Um, I'll, I'll jump ahead. Uh, in physics, in quantum, the, the basis of quantum mechanics these days, one of the primary theories that that uh, they believe um, explains all of the results they're getting from uh, cyclotrons and and uh, linear ion accelerators and and the big CERN uh, collider in Europe. Mm -hmm. To explain the data that they're having when they smash uh, uh, atoms together and protons and 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 they've come up with what's called string theory. Mm -hmm. Many of your listeners may have read something about string theory. Yeah, and, and the newer version is called M theory. But basically, those theories uh, say that there must be eleven dimensions to the universe, at least eleven. M theory mm -hmm. says there's twelve and Recently, some people think there's even more. Well, when we talk about dimensions, the ones we're most familiar with, in which we live in primarily in our social life, our waking life, are space and time. And right. space has three dimensions. Mm -hmm. they're, uh, they're, they're perpendicular to each other, 90 degrees off. You mm -hmm. can see it in a, a geometrical drawing of the three axes, you know, the X, Y, Z axis. Yeah. Uh, that's three dimensions. And then the other dimension is time. Time is a, a linear dimension. Is it before and after? And, you know, that's often seen on a graph. At the bottom of the graph is time. Uh, you can see it in every newspaper. We usually have graphs these days. Mm -hmm. So those are four dimensions. So what are the other seven dimensions? Well, if we live in all of these dimensions and, and a lot of mystics and and I believe we do live in all of these dimensions mm -hmm. but we we normally don't perceive anything in these other dimensions and yet uh when people take psychotropic drugs are uh develop their inner perception through meditation and and what I call psychophysics uh, oh, yeah. and the psychonautics they begin to perceive things in a new way they they begin to actually uh hear almost or uh, you know, it's, it's more than just sight and hearing. It's a direct contact, it's sort of like, um, you know, when you, when you connect to the Internet, one might say that the, it's sort of a sensory thing that the computer is doing. It's linking into a, a network of, of sharing information and flowing like that. So practicing yoga and uh, tantra um, is a way that mystics begin to develop those senses. And... In the beginning, uh, when a person is just mm, like a sort of a novice practicing meditation, they, at first they don't maybe perceive very much, or when they do, it's kind of confusing, especially mm -hmm. if they take LSD. <laughs> they, yeah. they may get very confused as to what's going on. But it's kind of like, um, you know, the great Helen Keller, uh, a lot of people know about her. She was born completely blind and completely deaf. And the world was quite confusing to her for a long time. Yeah. But eventually, through sheer effort, she started to make sense of it. Well, that's how um, contemplatives and mystics and practitioners of Tantra begin to explore and develop their inner sensory systems. Mm. And one of the ways of doing that that uh, have been recorded, uh, not only in India and Tibet, but also in uh in, among Christian mystics and saints, is by focusing on certain areas within the human body, uh, mm -hmm. like the heart. You know, even in yeah. in uh, Christianity, in Roman Catholicism, there's a cult of the yeah, sacred, right. sacred, sacred heart of Jesus. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, and then the, the Hesychists, uh, who used to focus on the Jesus prayer, they would say, focus your awareness in your abdomen. Mm -hmm. while, while you say this mantra over and over and over, they didn't call it a mantra, they call it the Jesus prayer. Mm -hmm. But, uh, it's by repeating the same thing over and over, uh, and by focusing on a certain area within your body, that part of the body begins to develop, uh, and mm -hmm. according, the imagery that they use in India is that it's like a flower that begins, uh, starts to unfold. The petals right. begin to unfold. Yeah, and and in Sanskrit these are called the chakras. Yeah, uh, and the chakras are there's at least seven of them. Mm -hmm. They correspond to the seven 
hidden dimensions that the string theory, uh, quantum physicists talk about. Mm. But uh, each each of them is like a separate brain within your body that can be developed and, and nourished uh, through focusing on it, mm. but focusing awareness. So um, that's the basic technique uh, of uh, a lot of tantric practice is during meditation, first of all, trying to stop the uh, activity of the normal mind, yeah. um, internal dialogue and, and bringing up memories. When you're able to, to attenuate those things and, um, uh, and, and get very quiet inside and just listen and try to feel what's going on within your body, Mm-hmm. Um, there's a throat chakra, there's one in the very center of your head, mm-hmm. there's one in the very top of the head, the, the, the pericardium, uh, also at the bottom of your spine and in your abdomen. And one can pick any one of these or all of them and, and just move from one to the other and slowly try to develop them um, so that they begin to open up to new sensory uh, um, experiences um, yeah. of the meditator or the psychonaut. Hmm. <clears throat> so that's uh, basically we live in all of these dimensions, but we, we're primarily attuned to space and time. And through uh, practice and understanding of almost uh, any of these mystical traditions, uh, you, you start to yourself become aware of new new realms of uh, experience. And mm-hmm. according to the Tibetans, there's there's two stages. The first stage is um, shutting down your normal thinking and getting really quiet. Mm-hmm. And, of course, they usually do it in the dark. It, classically, they would do it in a cave, you know, a very quiet cave right. and very yeah. dark. And when you get really quiet, at some point, the new sensory systems begin to activate and begin to pick up information from these other dimensions. And uh, I mean, even uh, in Islam, which is uh, traditional Islam, the uh, Prophet Muhammad used to go into a cave near near Mecca, right? Yeah, and he right. would pray. He would yeah. pray, and apparently, at some point, uh, they say maybe after forty days of going in and out of this cave, mm. they say he started picking up information. And he said it was the angel Gabriel, uh, which we would call mm-hmm. Gabriel. Yeah. The angel angel started um, uh, teaching him, and he right. wrote down the Quran. Basically, he was dictated yeah. by these this higher worlds, this higher yeah. higher being, and it's quite similar to the description of uh, things that have happened in India and Tibet and China among mystics, uh, and right. also in Christianity and the. What they call the Desert Fathers in the uh, early centuries of Christianity, there were a lot mm-hmm. of um, very serious Christians who would go into the desert and by themselves, like we call them hermits, they would yeah. go into caves and they would wrestle with the devil. You know, and the idea about wrestling with the devil is your own internal dialogue, your own thoughts, and your own uh, memories. If you're able to master those. And get really quiet and listen. Try mm. to listen for God or the angels or uh, just try to see for yourself what's out there with the intention of doing it. Uh, something happens. And and they, they, you can find hundreds of books written by many, many of these people uh, are related by them to their, their followers about what they experience. So, you know... The, most Western scientists have dismissed uh, all of these things, even religion to some extent, but certainly the accounts of mystics and uh, I guess in Europe you would call them witches and warlocks too. <laughs> so, you know, they're just human beings um, either accidentally or on purpose trying to communicate with with uh, with higher, higher powers or I don't even want to call them higher because higher and lower is sort of a uh, I don't know, it's probably not a good way to categorize things, but other, these mm-hmm. other dimensions, which may correlate very well with quantum mechanics, yeah. that there are these other dimensions. Uh, in quantum mechanics, they say we really can't measure them because they're very small. 
They're very, they're very small. They're so tiny and rolled up that we can, we don't have the technology to really explore them. But actually, mm-hmm. we do. The technology is our own human physiology. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, and and I think I think the universe, God, whatever you want to call it, the star maker. Uh, I think I think nature has designed us this way. We're evolving uh, toward being able to communicate with with the wider cosmos, and uh, maybe humans are just on the cusp of joining some kind of a a cosmic community uh, of yeah. consciousness that's uh, that's available, and that only in the past people who we call mystics and saints and and uh, magicians, maybe you know shamans, shamans yeah. are able to connect. Of course. Uh, what we know about shamans in South America, there's lots of people who do the same thing. They, um, I actually probably stopped taking uh, psychedelics back in my 20s, but while I was working in my PhD about 10 years ago, I was able to uh, experiment with ayahuasca with some traditional mm-hmm. teachers, uh, shamans from, from Central America. And uh, it was a real eye-opener because by then... I had been spending 30, 40 years thinking about these things and reading everything I could. Uh, what the ayahuasca did was yeah. um, I felt like I was connected directly with a new kind of an Internet. Uh, internet without the T, so it would be mm-hmm. Internet, you know. <laughs> I, I, I really felt that I was uh, being uh, – I had connected to this this, ent- this entire community of – consciousness that is the sort of biological envelope of our planet and right yeah uh it is very ancient and very wise and sort of a collective thing yeah. and and i got the feeling that uh it was almost like a teaching that came across that uh, it sort of told me that that when you die when when creatures die they don't really die they their biological body shells stop working because they get mm-hmm. old maybe and they you know, like an old car, they, they don't want to start anymore. Mm-hmm. And but but the experiences that have been uh, developed and caught and recorded throughout that individual's that individual conscious entity's uh, life within that body continue, and it, it mm-hmm. continues as a sort of an energy that's part of this this vast network of of awareness that's on the planet Earth. So yeah. yeah. I, I only did this for about a year, maybe maybe four ayahuasca experiences, and they were all very similar, uh, that there was uh, something there that was much bigger than the human race that was sort of a planetary bio-network of, mm. of awareness that was, allows us to join, and it includes uh, humans and zebras and mushrooms, <laughs> you know, mm. and... Um, and it was very welcoming, and it wanted to somehow teach humans to uh, figure out how to take care of the environment a little bit better. Yeah. So, yeah. So, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so that was my most recent experience. As, uh, uh, but, but my most, my most, uh, my, my real practice is uh, by myself. Yeah. At least once a day, I, I, I practice psychonautics or meditation for 30 minutes. Mm. And I use a timer. I use an iPhone timer. There's a lot of apps for meditation. You can set a timer, and right. you can have a Tibetan bell wake you up after 30 minutes. Um, Great. And what is the psychonautics aspect of your practice? What is the what? Excuse me. What is the psychonautics aspect of your of your daily practice? Oh well, uh, I begin by. Uh, I sit down on a, uh, a cushion, like a Japanese apu, right. uh, in front of a little altar I made that has photographs of my dead parents and mm-hmm. people I've known and mm-hmm. and uh, some people I've re- read a lot of, Teilhard de Chardin. And, mm. and anyway, then I, I blow out the, uh, or turn off the little light. I, I read for a while first before I begin to meditate. Right. I, I usually read something from, uh, I have a whole bunch of books by the you know, right by me there. Yeah. And I'll just sort of at random pick a book on mysticism or philosophy or mm-hmm. religion and read a few passages. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I will uh, turn off the light and say a few traditional prayers. Um, okay. I was brought up as a Roman Catholic and then I 
uh, kind of drifted away in college and started studying right. Hinduism. And I was actually, um, I had a ceremony where I became a Hindu at one point. Oh, My wow. parents thought that was a bit bizarre. <laughs> and then I, uh, <laughs> uh, but I feel like all religions are valid uh, in the particular culture that they grow in. Sure. Um, it's like fl- uh, flowers. You wouldn't say one flower is the only one, so let's kill all the other flowers. That this one flower is, is the real flower. I'm a rose. <laughs> Don't right. be no flowers before me. Um, yeah. I think all the religions are beautiful in their own way, just like all languages are beautiful. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're just, uh, grow up in different, different areas. So anyway, yeah. I, I used to say a few prayers for about uh, three or four or five minutes. Uh, some Sanskrit mantras I've learned. Mm-hmm. Um, I really believe everybody has to develop their own technique for meditation. You yeah. have to customize it for yourself. Mm-hmm. You find out what works. And, and that's the essence of Tantra. Tantra means uh, it's the teachings that have been accumulated over the centuries of what works. Right. So the, yeah. the ta- uh, that's, that was a major thing in India and Tibet mm-hmm. that let's, let's do what works. And part of it is sex. So in the West we know mm-hmm. Most people falsely think that Tantra, oh, that's the yoga of sex. Right. Well, sex is one way to to quiet your cognitive mind and communicate with these other dimensions and and your partner through through uh, sort of extrasensory perception, really, mm-hmm. uh, very intense. But and also drugs are a way to do it. But yeah. the, the most practical way is to practice a little bit every day. To gain control of and reprogram your own mind, like John Lilly right. talked about yeah. reprogramming, yeah. Uh, to develop the skills uh, to to quickly go into the silence. So right. I stop I stop praying and stop saying mantras. Um, mm-hmm. Then I often will focus on a particular area, a particular chakra within my body, and just try to feel it. Just spend some time trying to sense it uh, physically, mm-hmm. trying to. It's trying to obtain some kind of feeling of touch in in my heart hmm. or in the center of my brain or in my throat or in my abdomen. And um, then you try to just drop everything, even your intention, just sort of free-floating in this darkness and silence and listen. You just listen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, at some point, you'll start to sense a new sort of sensations that at first might be kind of confusing, but mm. if you progress with this uh, over you know months and and, and years as I did, um, it they, it slowly develops and makes more sense, and you begin to feel that you're really connecting to and in touch with this this sort of a cosmic internet internet let's call it. Yeah. Um, it really is you're part of it, and. And when you become aware of it, it becomes aware of you, and there's an exchange of, of energy and information that uh, I think it improves your health, uh, your peace of mind, but also gives you um, confidence and knowledge that that there is a meaning to to your life and to the life that we're, uh, you know, all the ups and downs we're going through as a as a planet and as people, and yeah. and then. Uh, I think my alarm usually goes off about 10 minutes before the 30 minutes is up. It just beeps once or twice, and then I really try hard to just mm-hmm. empty my mind and just feel the whole world around me and mm-hmm. all of the conscious. It's like an ocean of consciousness that we live in. Mm-hmm. But, you know, everybody who's alive is broadcasting electromagnetic energy. Right. Um, yeah. When your heart heart beats at five watts a minute. Yeah. You can actually see the radiation coming off of a human being if you wear, say, a, a, a night vision goggles like the military provide or a mm-hmm. sniper scope. You can see a person glowing a mile away. It's infrared radiation. You know, we oh, dismiss wow. it as, we often yeah. dismiss it as heat, but it's not heat. Yeah. It's, it's radiation. And so, um, this five watts is flowing out into the the, the planet, the biosphere, yeah. and it's a it's a vehicle. I really believe that uh, it's it's the 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 way that we communicate with other people and and other and animals and the, the entire environment around us. 
Right, and, right. Uh, but when we're so tied up with our thinking and, and internal verbalization and mm. and uh, remembering things, uh, we sort of mask mask that sense of being connected, and we feel mm. very separated. So by by plunging into this silence and feeling connected on a regular basis, um, mm. I think people will really um, heal themselves and and begin to heal their communities and the planet. Um, uh, unfortunately, most people are not so religious anymore, and it's even hard to get young people into practicing meditation. Yeah, but I, right. I think the integration of science mm -hmm. and mysticism is is probably going to uh, make a change as scientists become more aware that there really is something going on here and we're just on the verge of mm -hmm. beginning to explore it uh, yeah. we're like the you know the first fish that came up on the beach and lie, lying there in the air trying to see whether their deep sea fish eyes and slow, that has caused them slowly to become more acclimated to living on the land and, and suddenly the, the sea creatures started becoming land creatures Right. And I think yeah. that's I think that's probably the uh, assuming we survive for a little bit longer as a species, I think more and more of us will be learning to live and move into this this other these other dimensions yeah. in a real active way. That's mm -hmm. what I've tried to express in my new book, uh, yeah. where I've collected a, a lot of information on Christian, Indian, and Tibetan mysticism, and I tried to explain it in terms of science. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, I really like the way you went through, you know, different thinkers from Rudolf Steiner and Sri Aurobindo, uh, you know, even into Tibetan Buddhism, Christian mysticism, and then towards the end of the book, get more into the, the, the actual contemporary science of these things, which is, which is very valuable. Yeah. Yeah. When I, when I was uh, around 18, I actually had a, quite a powerful meditation experience. I went to some uh, woods one day and was uh, meditating on the chakras just for a few minutes. And um, really, I didn't think uh, I'd even gone in very deep. But when I opened my eyes and I moved my arm, all of these yeah. traces came off of it. So you know, it looks like, you know, the, the statues of Hindu gods with thousands of arms. And I was moving my arm around and seeing all these thousands of arms. So I'm just hallucinating after you know, a few minutes of uh, meditating on the chakras. And, you know, there's something that's so simple to get such a, a profound um, experience was uh, quite revelatory, really. Yes, and definitely it doesn't need to, uh, a person doesn't have to be highly educated uh, to, to begin to develop these things. Right. Some, sometimes the very simple people who haven't had much formal education yeah, yeah. Uh, have been saints and mystics. You know, Ramana Maharshi, I'm thinking of people who've had experiences when they're young in their teen years. Yeah. Suddenly this, these dimensions open up to them. That's they right. see how real they are, and, and they realize they're important and, and follow them the rest of their lives. Um, yeah. Uh, sadly, we've become as a culture too attuned to entertainment, focusing on, you know, yeah. things in space and time and, and passively looking at uh, Netflix. <laughs> and, you know, I'm not saying it's bad. Um, you do need an escape from from the office, mm -hmm. I suppose, but there's more to to it than just um, work and and entertainment. There's also the idea of growth, uh, individual right. growth, and, and growth as human beings. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's such a mystery that is. I mean, I've just been fortunate that I that I became passionate about it at an early age. Mm -hmm. I almost feel that it would be a good thing if. High school students, um, uh, people in their, you know, their, their mid-teens were introduced to something like uh, psilocybin or, mm -hmm. or, um, or ayahuasca uh, in a formal way, almost as right. a rite of passage, so that yeah. their, eye, their inner eyes would be open and they would see what's, you know, something that they normally uh, aren't, aren't aware of. And yeah. I think that might change their whole perception of, why we're here, and uh, where we came from, and where we're going. Right. Because those yeah, kind absolutely. of questions, they're really important questions. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I know, I know some schools are introducing meditation, which is obviously quite different, but, you know, still related in, in some ways. Yeah, so 
I urge people to buy my book so I can pay off my student loan. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I agree. People should, should buy your book. It's really, it's really excellent. Well, just uh, before we dash off, you, you mentioned uh, quite a few things that were of interest. And one of the things was, you know, the body, uh, the heart. And, you know, obviously in um, in Islam, there's also the, the story of uh, the Prophet Muhammad having his heart taken out and washed and put back again. And uh, you actually have a diagram in, in your book of the heart radiating this uh, sort of energy. So what what is going on if we're meditating on the abdomen or the heart or the pineal gland? Is um are we just cre- creating some energy or is it hormonal? Because there definitely is some kind of transform transformation that can occur in the consciousness. Well, here, here's the physiological explanation. Um, um, when my my son had to do a science fair project, we he got interested in biofeedback. Mm. So we obtained this little um, thing you put on your finger, and it measures the temperature of your finger very accurately. Mm-hmm. And the idea is by focusing your awareness on your fingertip, yeah. uh, the temperature will rise, will get higher. Right. And, yeah. and we actually did that. My, my son and I were able to do that, and he wrote a little paper on it and demonstrated it and got a good grade. But... Um, it made me realize that when you focus on an area of your body, yeah. you're sending your your nerve signals down there, mm. and they're trying to feel something, and so they cause the yeah. capillaries to dilate, to expand slightly. And the capillaries then let more warm blood through, and that okay. warm blood warms up that area, and it nourishes yeah. it. It brings more food to that area, and That's it also cleans it. It takes away the toxins. So if you focused huh. on your, uh, on your say your your abdomen, there's a yeah. sort of a distributed brain down there uh, yeah. that the uh, Sanskrit calls the chakra that that controls all of the digestion down there. So the the body is like a distributed brain system. We have um, our, the brain in our head. I think does a lot of the laptop computing work, like you know, yeah. uh, looking up language words while we're talking and. Remembering things and, and, and using logic. But, uh, but it doesn't want to have to get involved in regulating the, the, uh, your abdominal. You're digesting something at the same time. So there's like a little distributed brain down there that's, uh, got its own awareness. Yeah. But there's also, the, also the heart has its own awareness. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and your throat, they say the throat area. Yeah. Each of these areas, if, if you look at them with a the physiology, physiology book, they're rich with uh, endocrine glands and nerve nerve plexes. Yeah. And the act of practicing by f- trying to feel and focus on one of these areas dilates the capillaries, uh, f- nourishes them with more more uh, warm blood and heats them up and makes them more active, and they actually start to develop uh, 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 beyond what is the minimum that that we're born with, and. Uh, eventually, I think they start to communicate with what Steiner calls higher worlds and what yeah. the quantum mechanics call other dimensions mm-hmm. uh, outside of us. Mm-hmm. So, and also, it just just by doing that, you become more integrated as a person because yeah. there are a lot of individuals you can see who have these different centers of their body are actually in conflict. You know, everyone's mm-hmm. heard about the uh, uh, sort of a famous. Um, very effective um, uh, politician who's leading people and doing good things, but then he exposes himself, <laughs> you know, yes. uh, sexually. And, and, right. and well, that's 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 a different chakra down there in his genitals. Yeah. That uh, it's like a brain of its own. It's not that well integrated with the others, and uh, mm-hmm. or or somebody who maybe eats way too much. You know, they just sure. don't yeah. focus on food all the time. Because their abdominal chakra is, um, you know, sort of taking over or, or yeah. in conflict with uh, the cognitive brain. Right, or people right. who talk too much, like maybe me. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, the throat chakra is, you know, running away with uh, with all of the energy. Right. Uh, yeah. Or the heart, you know, you're always falling in love or mm-hmm. feeling, um, you know, altruistic. All these emotions are tend mm-hmm. to be associated with the heart area. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of mysteries here that need to be focused upon more by 
by really hard science, uh, the Western scientists, um, instead of looking at these things and the body as uh, something to be healed, uh, pathology, uh, they need to look on what we can do to evolve ourselves, mm -hmm. to grow uh, and, and increase our capabilities. Um, not just, you know, it's in sports, so your muscle systems work good, but, but your consciousness. How yeah. to integrate and grow your conscious awareness and mm. harmonize it throughout your body. So there's yeah. a lot that can be done, and anybody can do it, but the, the main thing is to have the intention to try and mm. to actually begin, you know, not just read about it. There are some people who just read about all these things but never sit down in the dark and try to meditate. Right. Uh, exactly. My own my own son and daughter are that way. They're grown now, but <laughs> <laughs> my, they like, um, you know, things like movies and games and mm. Uh, I love them, but I, they, you know, it's it's funny how they don't always follow their parents. <laughs> I guess that's it. <laughs> no, Sometimes I'm sure children not. go the opposite direction, you know. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely, they do. And so, what what would you recommend for somebody who wanted to begin to uh, cultivate some tantric psychophysics on a daily basis? Well, you know, one good thing is to begin with your own childhood tradition. Uh, most people mm -hmm. have been raised in a family that tried to give them some sense of their own cultural tradition, yeah. uh, re their religion, and probably they learned uh, prayers, one or more prayers as a child, mm -hmm. uh, although many people stop saying those prayers. Well, one one way of beginning meditation is to just go back to your roots and mm -hmm. sit there and connect to your childhood consciousness by saying some of those prayers, yeah. and yeah. then trying to be really quiet mm -hmm. and uh you can. There's all kinds of books. All the books are good about mysticism and, and meditation. I mm. mean, some are better than others. Um, but just uh, explore serendipitously, uh -huh. uh, and and you'll find that the universe sort of guides you. And uh, as you start to experience new things, yeah, new things will fall into place. You'll you'll maybe come across a book that was just perfect for what you need to to mm -hmm. learn at that time. Um, just have faith that something is going to happen, and mm. by practicing it will begin to happen. There's another thing called the yoga of dreams. Uh, you can actually um, develop your dreams to quite a, an extent. Uh, Carl Jung wrote a lot about this, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and there's also a Tibetan yoga of dreams where um, they have a lot of techniques for uh, making your dreams more eidetic and giving yourself control in them. There are simple techniques like... Uh, during a dream, try to look at the back of your hands. If you right. can, if you can connect your consciousness with the, the intention to look at the back of your hands, you may develop more control in your dream mm -hmm. and remember more of the dream too when you come out of it. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> so I hope I've touched on a few things that might uh, help inspire people. I, I don't know. I, no, no, definitely. Uh, hard to yeah. condense. Uh, you know, 30 or 40 years of reading stuff in a yeah. half an hour or so. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely it is, absolutely. But it's, it's a great book. I really liked that you went through uh, different uh, mystics and different thinkers and different uh, esoteric traditions and then uh, and then approached the science. And the science is, is actually very solid, so it's, it's, it's really good to know that part because we do have these rational brains that make us want to understand things. Uh, rationally or scientifically as well. But it's, it's very convincing. So it's great. Where, where can people find out more about you and where can they get the book? Or Well, they can uh, get the book from Amazon.com. I've written 16 books. Um, okay. Shelley Joy. Uh, it's also my website, Shelley Joy. Uh, it's spelled with an I, Shelley. S-H-E-L-L-I-J-O-Y-E dot -E net, N-E-T. ShellyJoy.net, or you can search on Amazon for Shelly space yeah. J-O-Y-E, or just search for tantric psychophysics. But I, my first book was called Tuning the Mind, and it discusses how to actually tune your mind to these other dimensions. Um, it's not as comprehensive of Asian uh, mysticism as, as the new book is, mm -hmm. but it, um, it's a, more of a focus on on the physics of, of your brain and consciousness. Mm. I also have another really good book called The Electromagnetic Brain, which came out about a year ago. 
which also touches a little bit on meditation, but also how the brain and consciousness interact and work. And it's it's great to uh, being able to write down my ideas and share them with people. Yeah. Otherwise, absolutely. you know, I, otherwise I'm just benefiting my own self and. God knows the world needs help <laughs> in as many ways yeah. as possible. Absolutely, it does. Well, it's been great speaking with you, and I really appreciate your time. Oh, great. Well, thank you.